Hello boys and girls, this tutorial is on redox reactions. In this tutorial we are going to learn what the heck a redox reaction is, how you know when one has occurred by assigning oxidation numbers, um, using oxidation numbers to account for the transfer of electrons during a chemical reaction, and then finally how to write half reactions. All right, so a redox reaction. First of all, redox is just a short way of saying reduction oxidation. So I might say redox reaction or I might say reduction oxidation reaction. They're the same thing. So redox reactions are any chemical reaction where electrons are leaving one element and going to another. So we talked about a lot of different kinds of reactions. We've talked about synthesis, decomp, combustion, single replacement, double replacement. Um, sometimes these reactions involve the transfer of electrons from one element to another during the course of that reaction. Those kinds of reactions are called redox reactions. And so um, you can actually take all of those groups of, of reactions we've talked about and you can actually group them all into the kind that transfer, of elect that transfer elect electrons and the kind that don't transfer electrons. The ones that do, those are called redox reactions. And what you need to understand is that in chemistry, electrons are kind of like money. They're currency. And that, those electrons being transferred from one element to another are often the driving force behind a chemical reaction. Why the reaction actually happens is because one atom wants those electrons more than the other. So the word reduction in oxidation reduction, the word reduction is when an atom gains electrons. So during the course of the reaction, the atom that gains electrons is the one that's been reduced, and oxidation is, a, is when an atom loses electrons. So of course, the element getting reduced only gets reduced or gains electrons from the element that has been oxidized or has lost its electrons. So essentially, ele the, ox the element that gets oxidized is losing its electron to the element that gets reduced. An easy way to remember the difference between oxidation and reduction is using this little fun memory device, oil rig. So oil stands for oxidation is loss, and the rig part stands for reduction is gain of electrons. So remember, oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. And something you should keep in mind is that you can't have one process happening without the other process happening. So because it is an electron transfer, the element that gains electrons is gaining them from an element that has lost electrons. So you need to understand that reduction and oxidation are not separate from each other. They happen because of each other. Some examples of redox reactions where electrons are transferred from one atom to another during the course of the reaction are reactions like uh, combustion reactions are always redox reactions. So that transfer of electrons involves a lot of energy output um, that would be, of course, fire. Um, com cellular respiration, photosynthesis, uh, the reaction that takes place in a battery that you could then use to power your cell phones or your iPods. Those reactions are all redox reactions. It is important to note that not all chemical reactions involve the transfer of electrons. Many of them do, but there are definitely some reactions that don't involve um, transfer of electrons. Um, I can think of a reaction that doesn't. Any double replacement reactions do not. So double replacement reactions really just involve ions switching places, but no electrons are transferred during the course of those reactions. So you should probably just remember that double replacement reactions are never redox reactions. That doesn't mean that the other reactions, synthesis, combustion, decomposition, that those reactions are always redox. Some of them are and some of them aren't, but double replacement reactions are never redox reactions. All right, so let's talk about using oxidation numbers to account for electron transfers in a reaction. So how can we tell, given a chemical reaction um, or an equation, whether or not it is a redox reaction? So like this reaction right here, this is the Haber process. Uh, Haber process is a process that is used to develop or to make usable nitrogen for fertilizer. It was developed by uh, Fritz Haber, 
uh, during World War I. Um, he won a Nobel Prize for it. Awesome. So is this a redox reaction or not? Um, it's hard to tell by just looking at the reaction whether or not electrons were transferred during the course of the reaction. You could probably draw a picture, um, draw Lewis dot diagrams, and count up electrons and decide. Um, that seems like a lot of work. So instead of doing that, we're going to uh, do a little accounting. And the best way to do that accounting is to assign a number to each element in this reaction called an oxidation number. And an oxidation number is also called an oxidation state. So you might hear me use those two terms, oxidation number and oxidation state, interchangeably. Um, and it's really just a way to account for where the electrons are. So which elements have electrons, how many do they have surrounding them? And remember, we're only really concerned with valence electrons. Um, and then, you know, during the course of the reaction, where did those electrons go? So this is the best way to determine whether or not a reaction is redox. So let's go through the rules for assigning oxidation numbers to individual elements, and then we'll talk about how to use those oxidation numbers to determine what's going on. Okay, so there are a number of rules here, seven of them. Um, one of them is multi-part, and you have to memorize these rules. So rules for assigning oxidation number uh, numbers. Number one, oxidation numbers are assigned per atom. So when you assign an oxidation state or an oxidation number to the elements in a chemical reaction, you the number that you write down is per atom. So for example, hydrogen in water. The, each hydrogen in water has an oxidation state of plus one. Um, so when we write the oxidation state underneath the hydrogen, we don't add the two hydrogens together and write plus two. We just write the oxidation state or oxidation number for one hydrogen. And the same is true for oxygen. Each oxygen has a minus two oxidation. And there are only one oxygen in that compound, um, but it wouldn't matter if there were five oxygens, we would still only write minus two because you assign oxidation numbers per atom. All right, rule number two, the oxidation number of an unbonded element is zero. Now realize that when I say element, I mean a single atom without a charge. So not ions, but elements. So this includes our Brinkelhoff elements. Remember, we have some elements that when they exist in their elemental state are actually diatomic. Um, so bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine are actually all doubled. Like here, bromine is a Brinkelhoff element, so it's Br2. And we have some other elements that are like sulfur, which we haven't really talked about, um, that are capable of bonding in groups larger than two. Um, but regardless, because these things are single elements that aren't bonded to some other element, and they also don't have charges because they're not ions, then their oxidation states are all zero. And all that really means is that um, sodium has just whatever electrons it had surrounding it. It has no other electrons being pulled towards it because it's all alone. Um, bromine right here, you've got two bromines bonded to each other, and each one is sharing the electrons completely equally, so neither one has more electrons around it than the other, so its oxidation state is zero. All right, so the oxidation state of a monatomic ion is its charge. So an unbonded monatomic ion, so it's just all alone, not bonded to anything, whatever its charge is, is, is what its oxidation state is. So sodium is plus one, this iron is plus two, and this nitrogen's oxidation state is minus three. All right, rule number four. The oxidation state of alkali metals is always plus one. The alkali metals, for those of you that don't remember, that's family one. So uh, for example, the sodium, each sodium in sodium sulfide would have a plus one oxidation state. And the potassium and potassium chloride would have a plus one oxidation state as well. So 
in a bonded chemical, the alkali metals are always plus one. Rule number five, the oxidation state of hydrogen, if it's bonded to something else, is usually plus one. For your case, we'll say always plus one. So each hydrogen in water has a plus one oxidation state. A hydrogen bonded to a chloride also has a plus one oxidation state. So always plus one. Rule number six, the oxidation state or oxidation number of oxygen is always minus two. So remember, since we're assigning per atom, um, that minus two under the O3 means that each of those three oxygens has a minus two oxidation state. And of course, the oxygen in water also has a minus two oxidation state. Um, it should be noted, however, the only, or one of the only times, or for you, the only time that oxygen does not have an oxidation state of minus two is in a hydrogen peroxide molecule. So whenever you have a hydrogen peroxide molecule, your oxygen's actually a minus one oxidation state, and that is the only time that that's gonna happen. So you need to remember that exception. All right, rule number seven, the oxidation state of fluorine is always minus one. Um, so fluorine being the most electronegative element is always going to pull one electron towards it and so it is always going to have a minus one oxidation state. Rule number eight, the oxidation state of the other halogens, uh, fluorine's a halogen, um, the other halogens are chlorine, bromine, and iodine, that's family 17, um, are also minus one, just like fluorine, unless they're bonded to fluorine or oxygen. And the reason why is because fluorine and oxygen are the most elect electronegative elements, so they're always going to have negative oxidation states because they pull electrons towards them. So if our chlorine and bromine or iodine are bonded to either fluorine or oxygen, then they're not getting a negative one oxidation state because they're having electrons pulled away from them. And so then they would have a positive oxidation state. So for example, Hydrochloric acid, um, chloride's always a minus one in hydrochloric acid. Um, in FeI3, um, iodine's bonded to anything other than fluorine or oxygen, it's gonna have a minus one oxidation state. Now, over here on oxygen dichloride right here, um, it is not a minus one oxidation state because oxygen's always minus two which means that each of those chlorines actually has a plus one oxidation state. And I will explain why it's plus one in a little bit, um, but it has to do with, you know, adding up oxidation states and making sure that it's got neutral oxidation total. All right, so I've given you all of these rules for very specific elements, oxygen, hydrogen, halogens, fluorine, your alkali metals, um, from all of those, you should be able to figure out the oxidation states of any of the other elements in a compound. And one of the rules that will help you do that is that the sum of the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound has to equal zero. So for example, KMNO4. KMNO4 is a neutral compound. What I mean by that is it doesn't have a charge. It's not a polyatomic ion. So the oxidation states of all the elements in this compound must add up to zero. So this is going to require a little bit of thought, so let's work through this. So in this compound, we have one potassium, one manganese, and four oxygens. We know oxidation number rules for both potassium and oxygen. Potassium is an alkali metal. All alkali metals have a plus one oxidation state. And oxygen, of course, is oxygen, and it always has a minus two oxidation state. Now here comes the math, and I'm gonna write this beneath it so you can kind of see what I'm doing. So there is one potassium, and that has a plus one oxidation state. And we're gonna add that to whatever manganese's oxidation state is, and then we're gonna add that to our four oxygens with their minus two oxidation state, and all of that has to add up to zero. So our plus one on our manganese, sorry, on our potassium, plus whatever our oxidation state is on our manganese, plus negative eight has to add up to zero, because four times negative two is negative eight. So negative eight, if we add a positive one to that, we're gonna get 
a negative seven. So what that, or sorry, yeah, a negative seven. So what that means is, is my manganese must carry a plus seven oxidation state. So that when I add plus seven and plus one to a minus eight, I get a zero. So all of that helped me figure out that the oxidation state on manganese is a plus seven. So let's do another one. Let's do SO2. So um, oxygen's got a minus two oxidation state always. So I want to know the oxidation state on the sulfur. And I know that they all have to add up to zero. So whatever my sulfur ends up being, if I add that to my oxygen oxidation numbers, it has to add up to zero. So sulfur plus minus four, right, because there's two oxygens, has to add up to zero. So that must mean that my sulfur has a plus four oxidation state. These can get pretty complicated, especially when you have, um, you know, a lot of different elements in your compound. Um, but just remember that the sum of the oxidation numbers in a compound has to equal zero. And the last rule is that the sum of the oxidation numbers in a polyatomic ion have to add up to the charge on the ion. So here are two polyatomic ions. We've got the chlorate ion and the carbonate ion. And they're ions because they have an overall charge. So just like up here where there was no charge, so the oxidation states had to add up to zero, here the oxidation states have to add up to the charge on the ion. So again, start with what you know. We know that oxygen always has a minus two oxidation state. And so we need to figure out the oxidation state on that chlorine. Now, chlorine would normally be a minus one if it were bonded to anything other than oxygen or fluorine. In this case, it, ha it happens to be bonded to oxygen. So we're going to need to figure out its oxidation state using this rule. So we know that whatever chlorine is, when we add it to our three oxygens with a minus two oxidation state, that the total has to add up to the charge. So that means whatever chlorine is plus negative six has to add up to negative one. So that must mean that your chlorine has a plus five oxidation state. Over here with carbonate, we'll do the same thing. Remember, oxygen is always minus two. So that means that whatever our carbon is, if we were to add it to our three minus two oxidation states uh, for each oxygen, that whole thing has to add up to minus two. The charge, it has to add up to the charge. Um, so whatever our chlorine is, sorry, our carbon is, plus minus six has to add up to minus two. So that must mean that our carbon has a plus four oxidation state. All right, so let's use our rules to assign oxidation numbers to the elements in potassium dichromate, K2Cr2O7. So start with the ones that we know for sure. So hopefully you remember that oxygens are always minus two. Potassiums, being an alkali metal, are always plus one. So that means that we need to figure out what chromium is. Um, so we'll use our little summation rule. This thing does not have a charge on it. So we know that our two potassiums with a plus one oxidation state plus our two chromiums plus our seven oxygens with a minus two oxidation state, all of that has to add up to zero because this thing does not have a charge. So then you just have to kind of figure out the math. So the potassiums add up to a plus two, and the oxygens add up to a minus 14. So we're trying to figure out what each chromium's oxidation state is. So I think the easiest way to do that is to go, okay, so I know that I've got minus 14 for all of the oxygens and a plus two for both of the potassiums. So 14 and plus two ends up minus 12. So that means our totals for our chromium have to be a minus 12, sorry, a plus 12, so that when we add that to our plus two, we get a plus 14 that would cancel out this minus 14 and give us a zero. So 
since there's two chromiums and they have to add up to plus 12, that must mean that each chromium has a plus 6 oxidation state. So since we assign oxidation state per element, you write plus 6 underneath the chromiums. All right, so how do we use oxidation states? Because assigning them is one thing, but then understanding what exactly it is you're doing that for is like a whole other thing. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to assign oxidation numbers if you don't know why you're doing it. So this is why you're doing it. If you have an example or an equation, like I gave you before, the Haber process, and I wanna know whether or not this is a redox reaction and where the electrons are going and where they're coming from. You know, the hard way is I could try to draw Lewis dot structures and figure it out from there, or I could just assign oxidation states to every element and see what's going on. So let's do that. So let's remember our rules. Rule number two said that oxidation states of individual elements that are non-bonded um, to anything other than themselves anyway is zero. So nitrogen is just N2. It's just two nitrogens bonded to each other, so their oxidation states are zero. Same thing with this hydrogen, it's two oxidation, or its oxidation state is zero because it's not bonded to anything other than itself. And then, of course, um, we know that on the other side, we've got nitrogen bonded to three hydrogens. Each hydrogen's going to have, sorry, a minus one oxidation on it. Uh, sorry, no, a plus one, plus one oxidation on each hydrogen. Um, so that means our nitrogen must have a minus 3 oxidation. Since this thing doesn't have a charge, that minus 3 has to add up to these three positives to equal 0. Okay, so we've signed oxidation states to every element in this compound. So let's see what's going on with each of these elements. All right, let's start with our nitrogen. Our nitrogen is going from a zero oxidation to a minus three. So each nitrogen in this compound is going from having a zero to a minus three. That is a reduction. It's going from zero to minus three. So nitrogen is being reduced. If you remember what reduced means, reduced means, um, so oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So the nitrogen is getting reduced because it's gaining electrons. The easiest way to look at this is it's going down. It's going from a zero to a minus three. That's a reduction. And then for hydrogen, our hydrogen is going from a zero oxidation to a plus one oxidation state. So it's going up in oxidation. Whenever it goes up in oxidation, our number, that, that is an oxidation reaction. So our nitrogen's being reduced, our hydrogen's being oxidized, so we can actually say, you know, if oxidation is loss of electrons, our hydrogens are losing electrons and the nitrogens are gaining those electrons. And that's why our oxidation states are changing. So we now know what's going on. We know now, by looking at just these oxidation numbers, that nitrogen is gaining electrons. It's being reduced. Its, its oxidation number is going down. Hydrogen is losing electrons. It's being oxidized um, because it's not being reduced. So we know it must be being oxidized. So here's the, here's the thing. You need to remember that when you're writing these equations and you're trying to determine what's being oxidized and what's being reduced, only one element is going to get oxidized and only one element is going to get reduced. You're never going to have two elements getting oxidized while one gets reduced or two getting reduced while three get oxidized. It's only one gets oxidized, one gets reduced. That, that's helpful to know because, you know, if you write your reaction and you write your oxidation numbers and you start looking at it and you're like, wait a second, I got two elements here that are getting reduced, then you know you've done something wrong. All right, and last but not least, let's talk about writing oxidation and reduction half reactions. So we're going to do this a lot when we talk about batteries, um, so it's a good idea to know how to do this. So an oxidation and reduction half reaction are just looking at the overall reaction and pulling out the half that's being oxidized and the half that's being reduced. So we'll use our example from above here. We knew that nitrogen becoming NH3 is gaining electrons and being reduced, and we know that hydrogen becoming or bonding to nitrogen to become NH3 is being oxidized. We figured that out using oxidation states. 
So now we're going to go ahead and just split the reaction into two reactions. And I will always just give you really simple ones for this. Um, I won't give you anything super terribly complicated. So let's start with our nitrogen or whatever is getting oxidized, actually. So our oxidation half reaction is going to be what's happening to our hydrogen. So we've got three hydrogens um, turning into two NH3. So notice that I left out the H2 because, or sorry, the N2 because it's not involved um, in the, well, it's not being oxidized. So we're only writing down what's getting oxidized. Um, so each hydrogen is going from a zero to a plus one oxidation state. So what that tells me is that each hydrogen is losing one electron. Well, how many hydrogens do we have? We have a total of six hydrogens, right? Two hydrogens here times three is six. So since there's a total of six hydrogens and each one is losing an electron, we need to account for those electrons. So we're gonna put that into the equation as our six electrons being lost from our hydrogens. Notice where I put them. I put them on the product side because they're no longer attached to the hydrogens, they're separate from the hydrogens. Remember, this is oxidation because oxidation is loss of electrons. Those six electrons used to be attached to our six hydrogens and now they're not. All right, the reduction half reaction is is um, nitrogen, right? So we have our N2, and our nitrogen is going from a zero oxidation state um, to become, or it's going, you know, it's bonding to the hydrogen, and its oxidation state is a minus three. So it's being reduced. It's going down in oxidation. It's reduction. Um, reduction is, so oxidation is loss, and reduction is gain of electrons. So we got to look at how many electrons are being gained. So we know that our nitrogen, each nitrogen, is gaining three electrons. Um, to go from a zero to a minus three, it must be gaining three negatives, three electrons. So we go back and we look, well, how many nitrogens do we have in this equation? We have two nitrogens, so two nitrogens. So each nitrogen gains three electrons. That's a total of six electrons. So we have to add in those six electrons. So our nitrogen is gaining electrons, so it's reduction, right? Reduction is gain to become NH3, where those three electrons are now associated with the nitrogen. So these are called half reactions. Something you should notice about half reactions, the number of electrons that are being lost is the same as the total number of electrons being gained. So when you add your half reactions together to make your total reaction, um, the electrons cancel because you have six on one side and six on the other, and then they would just cancel out. All right, so I think the last thing I'm going to do is just a big example. All right, so given this equation right here between sulfur and nitrate ions, I want you to determine what is getting oxidized and what's getting reduced, and then I want you to write the, and balance the half reactions. So the first thing that you're going to want to do to determine what's getting oxidized and reduced of course, is to assign oxidation numbers. So pa write this down, pause it, and see if you can get them. Okay, so the oxidation state on sulfur is zero because it's an element all by itself, not bonded to anything with no charge. Um, um, oxygens, of course, are always minus two, so the nitrogen in this case is going to be a plus five. Um, oxygens, of course, are always a minus two, so the sulfur is a plus four. Nitrogen's being minus two, that nit sorry, oxygen's being minus two makes that nitrogen a plus two. So from our oxidation numbers, we should be able to determine what's getting oxidized and what's getting reduced. So let's start with sulfur. Sulfur is going from a zero to a plus four oxidation. So it's going up in oxidation number, so it's being oxidized. And nitrogen is going from a plus 5 to a plus 2. So it's going down in oxidation number, so it's being reduced. And of course, 
our oxygens, nothing is happening to those. They're staying at the same oxidation state, which is how it should be. One thing gets oxidized and one thing gets reduced. So let's write our half reactions. All right, so what was getting oxidized is the sulfur. So our sulfur is going from being a single sulfur to being bonded to oxygen. And the oxidation state went from a zero to a plus four. So each sulfur went up by four um, oxidation states, which means that four electrons must have been lost, oxidation is a loss, from each sulfur. And our reduction half reaction has our nitrogen, which is in a nitrate ion, um, becoming nitrogen in a nitrogen monoxide ion, and it's going from a plus 5 to a plus 2 oxidation state. So in order for that to happen, um, each nitrogen had to gain 3 electrons. Um, all right, so when it says to balance the half reaction, what we mean by that is make sure that the electrons are balanced. Um, other things might not end up balanced, but the electrons should end up balanced. So right now, we have four electrons being lost from our sulfurs and only three electrons being gained by the nitrogen, but we need those electron numbers to be the same. So we're going to find a common multiple. We're going to make these 12. In order to make that 12, I had to multiply it by 3, so I have to do the same with everything else. And then same thing in this reaction. To make this a 12, I had to multiply that 3 by a 4, so I have to go in and make those all a 4. So those are our balanced um, half reactions.